The Restored Church and State, Volume 1. Sean Robinson and Laura Sedlins do the superlative job of restoration that we've all come to expect of them. Fine details all the way down to a 25-year-old typo. That's an accent grave, not accent aigu. Merci, Mara. Particularly fine work on the various mechanical tones that have been used on Cerebus over the years. And a lot of pen work that's been hidden for years. None of it easy. Like the mezzotint fog. Absolutely phenomenal job, Sean and Mara. Thank you as always. And thanks for uh, all of your updates uh, here on A Moment of Cerebus about your work. I know everybody appreciates that as well. As you can see, we're coming into the beginning of the Gerhardt era, uh, back in the 1980s at Aardvark Vanaheim. Question in the comments section last week, uh, having to do with the end of the Gerhardt era at Aardvark Vanaheim, uh, which is uh, Gerhardt's compensation for his 40% of the company. Before that happened, actually shortly before that happened, but I'm not sure how shortly before, uh, the Eastman and Laird team broke up and Pete Laird bought out uh, all of Kevin's interest in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And uh, I remember thinking at the time, if Peter had come to me and asked me what I thought uh, his best course of action would have been, um, I would have suggested that um, he give Kevin a courtesy royalty. In other words, uh, I don't think it should be possible for a creator to outright sell all of his interest in a creation. At the same time, if that creator wants out and that creator wants to name a figure and say, this is what I want, which is what Gerhardt wanted, and he gets that figure, which Gerhardt did, uh, then that's pretty much the end of it. It's a grown-up world. However, I don't think uh, it's injurious to um, the creator who is retaining ownership to uh, give the other guy a few points automatically that uh, this, this stays with him no matter what. Strictly on a voluntary basis and uh, in no way impugning the other guy's complete ownership of the property. If you want to relinquish ownership, that's entirely up to you. But in the case of uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I was thinking whatever Pete Laird ends up doing with this property, uh, whether he leases it to other people or leases parts of it to other people, or sells it outright to someone, um, there should be a situation where Kevin got three, two, three, four percent of whatever amount was on the table. 
Now, depending on who you sell it to, you might not be able to do that in perpetuity. Uh, whoever's sitting on the other side of the table, if they're buying your intellectual property outright, could say, uh, I don't want this on my books. I don't want to have to keep paying this guy this 2-3%. So unless you take that out of the deal, we don't have a deal here. That's not the case with Cerebus, or at least that's not with the case, the case with Cerebus so far. Uh, I intend to retain ownership of Cerebus and then ultimately put Cerebus into the public domain after I'm dead, but at the same time preserving the house and contents. Uh, I only pay myself personally $1,200 a month and I do that for the specific purpose of making sure virtually all of the money that comes in goes towards that goal preserving the intellectual property, preserving the house and contents. The world, to say the least of it, is not kindly disposed towards me. There are only 617 people on planet Earth who don't think that I'm a misogynist and are willing to say it publicly. That is not an auspicious reality to have to deal with when you're trying to preserve an intellectual property. So basically most of my time and energy and revenue goes towards preserving the material, preserving the contents of the house, and doing it for as long as possible a period of time in the hopes that this is just a temporary political condition that we're living through. And as I've said before, we don't know how temporary. It's already been 50 years and it's not getting better, it's getting worse. So mentally, I don't really look at any amount of money that comes in, no matter how much that amount of money is, uh, however large the windfall, and say, gee, what can I do with this? It's, it's either going to pay immediate expenses or expenses in the near term, or it's going towards preserving the intellectual, intellectual property long term. Long term, with the full awareness that the antagonism toward that intellectual property will get progressively worse and worse and worse and worse as the years go by. That has to be a central consideration for me in preserving my intellectual property. All of the restoration work that has been done on Church and State Volume 1, which includes Gerhard's creative contribution, will be made available to him if he's interested in it. Without Gerhard having to invest any money in that restoration, He's also completely entitled to reproduce any of his own work on Cerebus in any form that he wants and sell it to whoever he wants without having to consult me. As Jeff Seiler commented on uh, the anonymous Mr. J's bequest to uh, the Cerebus Trust, uh, that's something that each individual making the bequest, if they choose to make such a bequest, or to make the Cerebus Trust the beneficiary of a, a life insurance policy or any other permutation that they want to come up with, that's a decision that Mr. J has to make about how valuable Gerhard's contribution to Cerebus was and how much he wants to compensate Gerhard for that. In the near term, as a lump sum, uh, in a series of installment payments, and whether that just goes to Gerhardt or whether that goes to Gerhardt's estate in perpetuity. In my own defense, I will say that Gerhardt was the best compensated background artist in the history of the medium. 
He was a salaried employee and a very well salaried employee. That was unheard of for background artists who were always just piecework guys. This is how much you're going to get per page and that's it, we're over and done. He was credited, fully credited at all times for his contribution. His name is on the cover of all of the books. That's unheard of for a background artist. Each individual is going to have a different interpretation of whether Gerhardt was compensated fairly or not. About the only thing that I can say to those people who don't think Gerhardt was compensated fairly was, is contact Gerhardt at gerhardtart.com and get a commission from him, uh, buy some of his prints, or just send him a donation. Or make a bequest to the Cerebus Trust, but skew it entirely in Gerhardt's direction, or virtually all in Gerhardt's direction. To whatever extent possible, and it's going to be a lot of hard work coming up with the documentation uh, for the Cerebus Trust, I want it to reflect each individual donor's complete central belief in what is fair and what isn't fair in terms of compensation and preservation and maintenance of the Cerebus intellectual property, uh, the off-white house and all of the materials in it. And in conclusion, it's also completely unheard of that anyone would take the corporation that uh, contains the intellectual property as Aardvark Vanaheim contains the rights to Cerebus and compensate a background artist with 40% of that company. Don't do it said my lawyer. Don't do it, said my accountant. And I went ahead and did it. And ultimately, Gerhardt decided that he didn't want it. He didn't want 40% of the company. He wanted money. And he wanted this much money. And it was an acrimonious end to the partnership. But I did pay him exactly what it was that he asked for. Put another way, if Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster had by law been unable to transfer their rights to Superman past the point of 96, 97, or 98 percent of the intellectual property, over the course of the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, they would have been very, very wealthy men. And that's it for the weekly update this week for August 14th. Uh, God willing, we'll see you all next week for the update August 21st.